hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Angles and Attitudes. As always, my partner, John. John, how are you doing today? All right, Mark. I'm looking forward to this one uh, tonight. Well, again, I'm outnumbered because it's two AHI Hockey Hall of Fame members to uh, one, but I'm very proud and excited to be part of this trio again because today we're joined by a, a hockey, a Chicago hockey legend. Grant Mulvey. Grant, thanks for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Mark and John. Uh, this is an honor for me to be a part of, uh, of this. And, and uh, I hope that the next uh, 35 or 45 minutes go without uh, me getting kicked off this podcast. Uh, <laughs> well, it ain't going to be by us. It's going to be technology. So we won't worry about that. So. <laughs> All right, so we, we start at the beginning. Sudbury, Ontario, uh, first round draft pick, uh, number 16 overall in, in, in your draft year. We'll let you pick up the story from there. Well, I, I didn't spend much time in Sudbury, Ontario. My mother, uh, uh, she grew up in, in Copper Cliff, which is just a, you know, a stone's throw from Sudbury. And uh, my father worked for Inco, and which is the big um, nickel mine in uh, Sudbury. And uh, during that time, uh, my mother and father had our family. We all were born in Sudbury, but then we moved out to Merritt, British Columbia, a small little one horse cowboy town that uh, had a mine. My father was uh, an underground miner but um, uh, very proud of his, uh, his effort, his uh, work. And uh, a lot of the people in that town of Merritt were, were hardworking, diligent miners, loggers, ranchers, just hardworking people. And, and the jobs were hardworking jobs, underground mining, uh, the open pit in, in Logan Lake, which is a huge, I, I understand it to be the largest open pit mine in the Northern hemisphere of the globe. Uh, wow. You can see it from space, it's so large. Um, and uh, it's Highland Valley uh, mine. It was, it's the first open pit mine that went in. Uh, everything else was in the ground. And my father, um, that was his career. That was what he did. And uh, uh, my mother worked. And so my sister and brother and I, we were all raised in Merritt, British Columbia. And we learned what it was like to work hard. And uh, as my father would always say, hard work never guarantees success. It just distances failure. And I, I felt that through my life, and certainly through my hockey career, I should have worked harder. I could have worked harder, but I think I worked hard to stay at the level uh, of the NHL level. And uh, in my job, I worked diligently. I was there early and I stayed late. And uh, I think that that root, that real, that effort was rooted in the uh, small town in British Columbia called Merritt. And I'm so proud to be from there. This great work ethic you had, of course, just listening to this grant early on here in this conversation, definitely uh, you attributed to your parents, your father. I mean, you saw this right away from dad, correct? Yeah, I, I recall, it's, um, it's funny when we get older, you recall all these, uh, you know, these uh, messages of your parents that, boy, they were really smart, you know, but at, at, at that at 15 year old level, you didn't think they were very smart. And uh, uh, my father said, you get to choose your uniform and uh, make it the right uniform. And I, I, I really feel that the, the few things that, that resonated as we all were growing up and we listened to what we wanted to listen to. That was my father's mantra, was you get to pick the uniform that you get to wear. 
And I always, when I retired, I always wanted to wear a white shirt and a tie. I wanted to work downtown. I wanted to work in business. And uh, I, I truly enjoyed work because I got to do what I, wear the uniform that I, I, I always wanted to wear. And, and I was so blessed to wear the Blackhawk uniform and uh, be a part of just a storied uh, team that, uh, that we all were blessed to play with. Well, your, your story, because you, I, I looked at Sudbury and then you, you know, played uh, junior and Penticton and all. And I was like, well, wait a second. How did he get across the country like that? So you, you connected the dots there and you, you make a great point. My dad was a teacher for over 30 years and, you know, he, I, I still, I listen a lot more to him today uh, that I'm blessed that he's still around at 84 years old. And I can't believe how smart he is now, just as you said, that 40 or 50 years ago, it didn't seem like he knew anything, but those things start to pop up. And we're in that age group now. John's uh, children are in their early 30s and mine are in their late 20s. And they still think we're silly and, and we don't know. But every once in a while, one of those nuggets seems to pop up, right? And as a parent, you can kind of see the light go on over their heads and like, yeah, we got it. And begrudgingly, we don't want to give mom and dad credit for it, but we do anyway. So uh, we appreciate that. And that's a lot of what We've heard talking to your old teammates and a lot of guys, former guys throughout the NHL that played in the area that you did, that the work ethic and the appreciation for what it took to get there and how much more you had to work to stay um, is what guys like me and John in our late 50s and early 60s appreciate about you know your class, guys in the late 70s and early 80s that we watched. And as you said, wearing that at Blackhawk uniform, starting from you know, age 18 and being, you know, up until recently with Barkov, being the guy that the youngest guy to ever score an NHL goal. Um, you know, talk a little bit about when you got that uniform of an original six team with that crest on your jersey. I can't even imagine um, how excited you and your family must have been. Well, it, um, it, it really was a very exciting time. It was a it was a time that excitement can't really even, you know, the definition of excitement uh, is, is just not big enough to understand. Um, it, I was the first uh, in, in that area, I was the first, uh, I, I could have been one of the first uh, in British Columbia to be in the first round of the NHL. And my father always, um, would say, you know, he, he was the most positive guy. Um, and he would start with, you know, what did you do today? And he, he would just build off of that. Um, and he would tell me and my brother, um, and he would share, okay, well, what do you think the guys in, in Ontario, playing for the OHA, uh, it was called the OHA back then, um, uh, playing in the O, uh, what are they doing? Are they shooting pucks? Are they working out? Are they, you know, and, and uh, so when it came full circle that I was drafted in the first round uh, in the NHL and, um, you know, the boys from British Columbia, uh, and again, I'm not a, I, I don't dig in deep enough. I don't know the statistic, but I could have been the first, first round draft pick in British Columbia. And uh, uh, it went so fast that the comparison was no longer to the kids in the O. It was what are those people doing in the NHL to make them successful to stay in the NHL and uh, I I really uh, connect with my father and mother uh, in in assisting me and helping me and I connect with my brother and sister so well in those days to to keep me on the uh, in, in, in between the guardrails, because I was definitely a guy 
I was a rebel, a redneck, a cowboy. I was every single thing that you didn't uh, think that a, a guy was going to be successful. And I, I really, you know, really um, think that my parents and my brother and sister, my sister's older, and I have a younger brother who played in the NHL also. And um, they're, they really kind of guided me and helped me. And especially in those first four or five years, you know, they were, they were just unbelievable. Mark, uh, uh, Grant, I want to ask you, 1974-75, back in those days, Mark and I have coached a lot of amateur hockey here in Illinois, and we played hockey when you were coming up. But 1974-75 training camp was at the old stadium on West Madison. So now when you walk into this Chicago stadium, this iconic building, and you see the likes of number 21, Stan Makita. You see the likes of number 16, Chico Matti. You see the likes of number seven, Pitt Mark, Doug Jarrett, uh, Stapleton and left to go to the Cougars, Bill White, and of course the legendary Esposito. I mean, can you just tell me what was going through your mind when you hit West Madison? Well, if you do the calculations, I was still 17 years old. Yeah. So in my, as an adult now, and as, an, as a senior adult, how many 17 year olds have you ever come across that don't think they know everything, that don't think that they are bigger than life and don't think that what's going on around them is any more usual than unusual than, than normal. This is normal. And, and I think that that really became, um, it was never normal, but it was not unusual because I was put there for a reason. Uh, I remember skating around in, and our good friend Jimmy Pappen, uh, who's struggling right now with, uh, with uh, you know, the dreaded disease. Um, I, I hope he's doing fine. Jimmy and I skated around and Jimmy, I was taking, I was there to take Jimmy's job. I didn't know that, but he was the right winger on the top line. Cliffy and Cliff Coral and Jimmy Pappen. And, you know, I, I was skating around. And so my mother's from Copper Cliff and her family name is Topazzini. So, John, that's why you and I like each other. We've got a little Italian in us. <laughs> yeah, and, sure. uh, my, uh, and, and my mother grew up watching Jimmy Pappen as a young boy because Jimmy grew up in Copper Cliff also. And, uh, and so I went up and introduced myself and, and later, long, long later, you know, maybe years later, you know, I hear the story that Jimmy went home to his wife and, and said, I'm really, really, really getting old because there was a boy that skated a player that skated around with me today that said you know my mother <laughs> you know and you know it, it, my mother watched you play hockey watched you grow up and and you know they just kind of he he realized time was changing and and for me I was there to take his job and uh, there couldn't have been a better guy to laugh and, and uh, introduce me to the NHL was Jimmy Papp. Well, it, that's amazing that you say that because my son is uh, working with uh, U18s and the first, it's the first season he's worked with them. So that puts him, he's 10 years older than they are. And the first thing he did was complain about how uncoachable a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds are at like just below a triple A level. And here you are at 17, just short of 18 skating in the NHL. And, and you brought up uh, Jimmy Pappen. Were there others 
where, where you had that moment where every once in a while you had to say, this isn't so normal, kid. We're going to have to put you back in your place, whether it was loading bags on a bus or where you're just like, whoa, wait a second. I'm not exactly where I think I am at this point. Oh, my God. You know, often, often the stories, <laughs> uh, you know, Stan was always great for that. Makita was always great to be able to put you in your place. Um, it probably for me happened more my second and third year because I was struggling for my identity in my second and third and fourth year in the NHL, we were going through our own team identity and my dearest friend, uh, and I, he still is my dearest friend, he's a true brother uh, of mine, is Phil Russell. And Phil was a no-nonsense guy. He would tell you the way it was. And I'm not, I'm not saying one thing that Maggie wasn't, the, you know, Keith Magnuson or Cliff Coral or Stan Mikita. Uh, you know, they were all very good. You know, I was blessed to have wonderful Billy White. Billy White was my, my true mentor and he loved me. Um, but Phil Russell was a guy that was not afraid to tell you that you're out of place, that you are, or this, you're, you haven't done anything yet. And back in those days, even the trainers, Skip Thayer, Louis Varga, Skippy, it, it, they would look at you and, and if you came in with a bruise or, you know, like, get out of here, you know, like, I, and Louie, I'll be, one of the greatest lines Louis Varga ever said, I'll be here when you, you are gone and the next guy is gone. So don't <laughs> you be too, sh you know, and yeah. it's things like that, that I don't, you know, I was talking to Donnie Granado, uh, and Donnie Granado coaches, he's the head coach of Buffalo Sabres. And Donnie was saying that the young kids in the NHL today, the, the young ones, 20, 25 year old, they're really dictating the pace of the team. Uh, unlike where, when I broke in, the older guys, were dictating the pace. They were dictating when the practices were, and they were Stan Makita, Jimmy Pappen, you know, and they were all great guys. Um, Dennis Hall and Pitt Martin and and uh, Billy White, and you know, they all dictated the pace. So when a young guy like me would step out of line at all they would just straighten me out quickly. And I really couldn't find my identity, nor could we as a team until Bob Fulford came in uh, and took the reins of the Blackhawks in 1977. And things started to get different. And, um, and, and the next few years um, were successful. Grant, was it because you thought maybe Billy, I know Billy Ray was your first coach with the Hawks. Was Billy a little bit now past the game when you got there? I don't know, because again, um, uh, the older players loved Billy Ray. Billy Ray had a great communication with the older players, the older mindset, because those guys had paid their price, paid the price to play in the NHL. They were the ones that were dictating the pace, if you want to say. They were running in, fr in, front of, in, in front of the class, in front of the team. That was their team. And Billy Ray was their, um, was their uh, confidant, you know. And, and so he would come in the dressing room and, you know, his style was their style. Their style was his style. 
And it was not my style because I was used to coaches coming in and yelling at you and treating you like a, a you know, a, a, a real, you know, child. Um, Billy never did that. He treated these guys with great deal of respect. N Billy never raised his voice, never, never challenged. He talked to you. He wanted you to do it. And that was something a young guy, uh, I think a young guy needs that more uh, 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 aggressive, uh, but loving Mm -hmm. feel and uh uh billy was loved by the older guys uh and uh and and i loved billy ray don't get me wrong he was a great yeah. coach he was a great guy great man great man him and tommy ivan if you think about the staff today which is awesome today's coaching staff you got like 10 guys behind the bench. bench. <laughs> you know, I mean, you got 10 guys up in the, you know, here and here. And... <laughs> Tommy Ivan was the general manager. Billy Ray was the coach. Skip Thayer was the medical trainer. And uh, Louis Varga was the equipment manager. That's it. Yeah, when the Blackhawks won in 2010, uh, the, they won the Stanley Cup. We were on the bus and I looked over to Cliff Coral and I said, we could never have won the Stanley Cup. There was only five guys running the whole organization. How could they put a parade together? <laughs> Would have been a real no. short one. That's for sure. That's right, right? The, I get the biggest kick grant out of the guy who has the piece in his wrist. His job on the bench is right. He's talking to somebody oh, about a, a offside or a replay, or he's ordering oh, yeah. dinner for later, making reservations. How do you make a line change when there's five guys behind the bench and you're trying to hop over the boards, right? <laughs> well, the other day, I, I can't recall who the player was. Um, I think it was Kreider in New York. He took the iPad uh, that they were looking at and he fired it into the bench certainly breaking the ipad they didn't show that but he fired the ipad now i just want to share with you gentlemen and everybody that listens to this podcast there's a card a, a player card that i have that i often sign for uh, uh for young people that want to you know and that card has tape on my stick, on the shaft of my stick, because I ran out of sticks and <laughs> I had a broken <laughs> shaft. And Louie said, you're not going to play much anyways. Just tape the shaft up. And they took a picture and it's yeah, there's tape on my shaft. Could you imagine today? Now, a dozen uh, sticks back in those days probably cost 30 bucks. I don't know. Well, you know, maybe 50. How much that iPad cost? Well, you know, goodness. It's, we're just firing it's a different it. world. It, it's a different world. Two points. Number one, Phil Russell is my all-time favorite. Growing up, I had one picture in my bedroom at home, John, in Norwich. It was Phil Russell, yeah. a black and white picture out of the newspaper. Second, and and he uh, john marks told stories that him and phil would would wrestle Russell. right like two bears they would they would go at it at least once or twice during the year i do remember that story from from john marks the other thing you made the point about that donnie granado said about the younger players running the ship and i look at a guy like jack eichel right had all the talent in the world and didn't win at buffalo wanted to get out of buffalo went to to you know vegas and obviously is hurt but vegas for the first time didn't make the playoffs either is that an indicator at times that the people running the ship the younger guys need to be brought back in the line a little bit more um you know you're talking about coaches was jo joel quinville the guy with the blackhawks that kind of brought that all back 
in the line to, to set them up for the championship run? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I agree with Phil Russell. Phil is one of my uh, all-time favorite, favorite, favorite people. He is, uh, um, he's just, uh, I, he's a brother, you know, I mean, and, and uh, uh, I admire him in every, every aspect of life. And, uh, uh, and, you know, when I spoke to Donnie Granado, I was, Donnie has been coaching. I've known his family. I've known him since he's been, a, you know, five years old. And, you know, Don, Donnie understands where the true wealth of a hockey team lies. And that is in the talent and the speed of the players performing every night and he told me and i'm i'm gonna hold him to it that uh, be be on the watchful eye of buffalo sabers he said their talent level is so high with so many young players and you see that in today's playoffs look at uh these young players that are given the chance to play and really give, you know, they, they've played all their life. They know the responsibility and they go out and challenge it. And then there's others, obviously, like Eichel, that might not be able to handle that. That uh, I don't know Jack Eichel at all, uh, but maybe he wasn't able to really handle that pressure of taking that team to another level. I don't know. He's a heck of a hockey player, but um, uh, these young players, my grandson, I, I have four grandchildren and there, it wouldn't be right with me talking for 15, 20 minutes without uh, talking about my grandchildren. And uh, I have a nine, uh, my, we have a nine year old and he's going to be 10. He's a 2012. Uh, he's, and last year he was the most improved player on his squirt triple A team. And this year I told him that he has to be the most improved player on the team every year of his life. And I think when kids coming into the NHL, they really want to get better now. They want to be the most improved player. They don't necessarily want to just be there. They want to do things that, like Zegras, he's a talented, talented player, and he did a thing something that now everybody is trying to copy. You know, you go you go into the uh, ice rink and you see all these nine and ten and eleven year old kids all doing Zegras. You know, and so these kids all want to get better and better and better and faster and faster. And that's the beautiful thing about the NHL right now. The progression from when you played, and of course, you've also coached when you were coaching here in Chicago with the Wolves. Have you seen this trend really just take off with more and more people get where this sport now has become, as Mark Sun does a uh, clinics out here and uh you see it where people and their kids are just this is really uh, a yearly thing it's almost like it's six days a week in the summer now uh, Grant. i do i i was blessed um uh, last summer to um to go on the ice with a young boy uh here local young boy chicago probably the best nine-year-old probably the best 2012 in the Midwest, uh, he is a talented, talented, talented kid. He's 10 years old and I was on the ice with him almost every day last summer, Monday through Thursday. Uh, and he skates well, uh, he shoots incredibly well. He handles the puck unbelievable and he's incredibly creative. He's 10 years old. I keep telling him, his mother and father, 
that uh, he needs to he needs to ride a bike. You know, he needs to do other things. Go, you know, climb a rope. And he loves to fish. And he he uh, uh, he's learning that there has to be some other things. Other like I, I remember when Walter Payton. I was so blessed to be a friend of Walter's and he and I would get together and I would always laugh at him saying that I thought that football and the bears, they were, it was a great recreation sport. And he would laugh he, because I thought of football as being a recreation sport because I played high school football. I played all football growing up but I never took it serious. I never was going to be a football player. I was going to be a hockey player. I wanted to be a hockey player. So I, I played football just to play hockey, just to figure out being a better hockey player. I think these kids need that today. They need to be riding their bike. They need to be playing baseball. They need to be playing tennis and doing those other things. I, that's a great point. And, and like John said, my son's running the, and, you know, I call him this morning. I said, where are you coming? He said, I'm coming back from Rocket, Dad, in Bolingbrook. I had a 6 a.m. skate and a 7 a.m. skate and, you know, you know, three or four kids at a crack. But you're right. Even for John and I, uh, instructors with Learn to Skaters, six and seven year old, when you try to talk to a kid and say, you know, get your body in a certain position, you know, like when you play baseball and you bend at the knees and you get your bottom down and your head is up and the kid says, I don't play baseball. And he says, well, what about, you know, playing basketball where you play defense and you're down and don't play. How about a skateboard? Can we talk about a skateboard so we can learn the concept of pushing one foot on the skateboard and the other one pushes. And even from an instructor standpoint, it becomes very difficult because you have no sense of reference to try to get the light to go on for the kid because all he knows is he straps his skates on, puts his equipment on, and for an hour a day, that's all he does. And the other part, I'm sure that nine-year-old and your grandchildren, the socialization, talking to other kids, being on other teams, being a part of other groups, that right. not everybody has the same interest that you do, that you have to learn to build friendships and relationships with people who don't have all of the same um, you know, interests as you do, maybe, right? Well, yeah, it, it, that's, that's fantastic, Mark, because Harrison invited me to go with him and his father to a, um, a, uh, a, a tournament, an end of year tournament in Buffalo, New York. And I did, I, went, I was there, I took part in it and I watched all these kids. There was kids from many, many areas of the, city, of, of the country. And uh, it, was, it was great. The most important thing my grandson wanted to do, and it was so awesome, go to Tim Hortons. <laughs> <laughs> you get him a double double. <laughs> uh, you know it. I, and he knew all of the everything about Tim Hortons. Well, uh, the bad thing was is that he went to Tim Hortons before his game. Uh -huh. Grampy took him and. Uh, uh, and he uh, scored the winning, tying and winning goal. And so every pregame meal had to be at uh, Tim Hortons from there on in. You know? but, He's a true hockey player, right? Yeah. And he broke, don't yeah, say he, he, he wanted to know what Tim Horton was all about. Dad, Grampy, did you play against Tim Horton? What was he all about? And and that really is a very important part. If the, if the child wants to learn more about the game, you know, I was so honored and blessed to be a part of the Illinois Hockey Hall of Fame. And I got a chance to sit beside Kendall Coyne and I asked her those questions. It's like, who did you admire? when you were a young girl growing up in a sport that didn't have a whole lot of history to that part. And she said a lot of her history was with the Blackhawks, mm -hmm. a lot of Blackhawk history, but people like Camry Granado was uh, just like, 
you know, so special for her. And it's people that you have to, in the game, you have to investigate the game. You have to learn the people. You have to be a part. And I was just so blessed. I, 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 I again, I, I'm, I'm just such, so honored to be a part. But I got a chance to play with Stan Makita and the probably one of the finest, finest hockey players was Denny Savard. And those two center icemen, they were so different, but yet they were the most awesome players. And uh, uh, so you had to learn the history to become better. And uh, I think that if I learned anything, I was, when I first came, I was young thinking I was actually going to be, you know, making history when I should have been really learning history. Grant, uh, before I let Mike, uh, I, I know we're go, uh, go talking a little bit about all this stuff, but you talk about making history. Do you remember a history lesson you taught everybody on February 3rd, 1982? Five goals, <laughs> two assists. You want to take us through that night? Because I think you played lotto that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I have to say, I had a young family at that time. My son uh, was only uh, two years old. And my wife, you know, as hockey players and athletes are all prima donnas anyways. And, you know, we had pregame meals. The game was in Chicago. It was the first game that uh, Bob Pulford had taken over for Keith Magnuson. And, um, and uh, I, I went home and I, I really wanted to play well that night. We were playing St. Louis and, and I felt good about my game. I felt good about St. Louis. And, uh, you know, my wife made the baked potato wrong or something, you know, and, <laughs> you, you know, the drill, it, it's, so what? Yeah. And so, and my son at, uh, wasn't feeling real good. So she wasn't going to go to the game. I went to the game a little early and I'm now prepared. I never broke a hockey stick with a shot. I think in my life, because I used two by fours, they didn't break. They were good for slashing. They were good for cross-checking. <laughs> and they were good for shooting. But they didn't break. Well, the warm-up, I break a stick. And Tony's in the net. And he looks at me with those daggers that he could throw. And he was so mad because my stick went flying right over his head. Well, the first shift of the game... I get a chance, I pull, drag it, uh, the hook and drag, and I pull it across, and I shoot the puck, and it hit Liud in the, on the shaft of the stick. And I'm like, duh, I can't believe this. Well, it went on in that first period, I had four and one uh, helper, four goals and one helper, and I think Denny Savard put one off my, literally put one off my backside and, and uh, put it in the net. And uh, Terry Ruskowski, Reggie Kerr, uh, they, were, they were my line mates and they did all the work. And I, I somehow got the uh, notoriety of, of, but they did all the work. And in the second period, uh, I got in a fight. And I got seven minutes in penalties in the second period. Came back in the third period, scored one and one, and uh, one goal, one assist. And after the game, I'm feeling pretty good about myself, you know. Scored five goals. Tony Esposito, my dearest friend, he goes, we're in the shower. And he goes, you're the stupidest guy I ever met. And I'm like, Tony, you're not very nice, you know? He goes, you had the game of games going on and you let them take you out of the game for that stupid fight. 
I'm like, wow, what a, you know. Well, today, the other day, I, I uh, was with Patrick Kane, and I said to Patrick, I said, if you ever get five goals, you got to get in a fight, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, if if Kaner scored five goals and got in a fight, the headline would be the fight, well, not the five goals. <laughs> yeah, right, Mark. So That's that right. would you buried the lead on that one, Grant. The, That's the, right. The, That's the tussle, right. Uh, the the drop in the mitts would have been what uh, what got the headlines on that one, no doubt. But yeah. it was interesting. You you talked about your sticks. That scoring goals was like number three on the list. The cross check. The slash and then the goal scoring. I noticed very, it was not so subtle that that was number three. We've had conversations with guys in your, in your generation. You know, the, the one was, um, you know, uh, Mark Howe had talked about how that stick at a certain point, he goes, if you get too close to me, that's my area and you will taste the Sherwood. And I have no problem you know, telling you, we're going to, we're going to come to an agreement here. That's your space. And this is mine. And if you invade it, you're probably going to be eating some twig. Right. And I'm sure in the generation that you played in and John and I grew up watching that you guys policed yourselves a lot more than obviously what happens in the league today. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. The, uh, I, I, and certainly I, I don't uh, think, the game should go back to that level. People uh, were vicious, vicious. Uh, the slashes, the uh, the stick work was incredible. And uh, we had to live in that environment. And uh, it was intimidating. And I think the game is being played today at a pace that cannot be intimidating. It, it's got to be able to go. And when you go, you got to chase the guy that's going. And you that guy can't worry that somebody's going to come in and cross check him in the back or slash him or, or spear him or, you know, or hit him from the back. We got hit all the time from the back. Yeah. And uh, those injuries are, are career ending. And uh, I, I just, uh, I, I'm so proud of the NHL for policing the uh, wrongdoings of sticking. And, you know, there was a player the other day that headbutted a player. No one was injured because the guy had a shield on and, uh, but it was just a foolish, foolish, Mm -hmm. um, penalty and put the team behind uh, because the foolishness was it didn't intimidate the player because the player is covered. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, now when there was no helmets and you, that's why tough guys uh, changed the rule. Like you, you'll listen to some guys and they'll say Stan Mikita changed the rule because he, Started wearing helmets. It was the tough guys that started wearing helmets because you get in a fight, and the first thing they would grab was your hair. And if you had a helmet on, they couldn't grab your hair. So it protected. The second thing was that you could tuck your head in where and they would hit your head instead of hitting, or they would hit the helmet instead of hitting your head. Uh, and so when Tiger Williams and all of the big tough guys started putting helmets on, Willie Plett yeah. uh, put his hel uh, uh, helmet on, Grant Mulvey was right there, uh, you know. <laughs> but you well, know who didn't? You know who didn't? One of my favorite, favorite, favorite all-time guys in the NHL was Al Secord, oh. and Rock never put a helmet on. He played, he played tough, he fought everybody, and scored 50 goals to boot. So not a lot of that kind of hockey player left. No. No, and you're talking, that was Darnell Nurse from uh, Edmonton. He ended up getting suspended. He was one of their top four defensemen, and they almost end up losing the series 
because when you're playing a, a best of seven, you don't have time to have a guy, you know, one of your top four take a night off. So it was right. interesting, you know, uh, what sort of conversation, you know, the leaders in the room police that and say, hey, you know, you put yourself ahead of the team. And I'm sure you guys heard a lot of those stories when you were younger, too, with the Makitas and the Magnusons and those guys going, nobody's bigger than the team. And if you're going to continue to put yourself ahead of the team, we're going to have a problem, right? Well, that, that's exactly right, Mark. Uh, you, you just could not. Uh, there was uh, uh, a, a real message uh, that penalties. Now, again, you know, in a playoff game, um, you almost had to uh, bring a hatchet out to get a penalty. You know, right. I mean, there, there was, you know, there weren't a lot of penalties in a playoff game when I played and there was a lot of brutal, brutal, brutal hits and cross checks and slashes and, but you never wanted to take that errant uh, penalty because you really put your team at risk and penalties back in those days, um, you know, if you got three penalties in a game, uh, that the other team got three power plays. That was huge. And, and not like today, they get nine, 10 power play chances. You know, no wonder, uh, you know, Betskin can rip it from the left side there. Um, he gets a lot of practice time. Well, that's uh, Tampa. Um, yeah. You know, Toronto, they, they early in the series with Toronto and Tampa, and it's a, you know, obviously a shame that uh, – Toronto didn't finish that series off, but what was your number one? Just staying out of the penalty box. Let's just play five on five and let's see what right. we have on our five against our, their five with Matthews and Marner and Tavares. And you start looking at that talent, but if they're not on the ice, you get five penalties. That's 10 minutes. You lose a half a period. Half a period. Of, and now they're sitting, right? And you know, you're sitting your next shift after sitting for five minutes, your legs aren't there, right? You're so all of those little things build in that regard. One thing I yeah, wanted to bring up, I'm sorry, you brought up the penalties. Talk about a guy like Savard, Makita, um, you know, going back even farther, Richard. Imagine the skill level, the, the point totals, if they were able to play in today's NHL, right? So it's not fair to compare because they would they would top the chart. Yeah, they were not as protected, exactly. Right. 150, 200 points if someone's not grabbing them or hooking them or holding them, right? Well, we let, I, you know, we've had conversation about it. And when they took the red line out of the two line pass, and you remember the old Chicago stadium, you know, it was like a sidewalk, you know, between the blue lines. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of room. And now, could you imagine Dougie Wilson? coming around the net full speed and hitting Denny Savard at the far blue line. Yep. Jeez. Those guys would have been pressured back. You, you know, the game would have been a, a complete different, different, different game today. That's what happens. And uh, uh, you know, every once in a while you'll see, a, a D-man or somebody spring a guy and that guy goes in for a breakaway or gets a good two-on-one chance uh, in a so uh, the, the rule changes have really really made a, a huge difference penalties are definitely up compared to the days of, of old but um, uh, I like the game today it's a, it's a it's a great Well, it's game. well put by you because it's like you said, Grant, earlier, it's go, go, go now. There, yeah, exactly. My Who's... grandson, he skates like the wind. He, it, he doesn't stop. He forechecks, backchecks. He's, he goes and his skating, he's on the ice skating all the time. And we, uh, when I played for... Um, uh, when Al Secord first came to the Blackhawks, Al was on our line for a while. Ruskowski, Mulvey, and Al Secord. And Al Secord's 
nickname was Rocky from the movie. And somebody gave me a, a shirt. They gave all of us a shirt. And I had saved, I saved everything. And uh, it was called the Wrecking Crew. And it was Rocky, Ski, and Mulvey. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Wrecking Crew. It was awesome. And so after 40 years or whatever it's been, I still had it in my drawer. Didn't fit me anymore, but guess who it fit? Your grandson. Harrison, yeah, my little grandson. Oh, wow. And I, I set up this ball and chain, and we call it the wrecking crew, but it weighs in at about 25, 30 pounds. He skates with that all the time. He'll skate for 30 minutes with that ball and chain and doing round, up and backs and inside grippers and uh, and he's nine years old. That's what these kids are doing today. And that's no, why they're so awesome. So could you imagine a talent like you said, Richard, a, a talent like Makita, Savard, Savard, Wilson, my goodness, the game, Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr, oh God, he would have dominated the dominated plus. Unbelievable. You know, um, we we turned to last, we we went over time, Grant, so we appreciate that. And then we have a tradition here, and John's the goalie, so the goalie gets the last question. But before I turn it over to John, the one thing that I would like to say that was has been really neat in talking to you the last few minutes, especially, I can just feel the grandpa in you. And it I gotta tell you, it is so neat, it gives me chills. You're not a former NHL or a guy that coached the Wolves or anything else. That's just a really proud grandpa talking. And that is really neat and really refreshing and, and continue to enjoy and appreciate that. Cause as I said, my dad's 82, my mom, my dad's 84, my mom's 82 and all the grandkids are in their late twenties, or early thirties. And grandpa would give one more time to complain about being cold in a rink or having to drive to the Polar Dome or Southwest Ice Arena or wherever it is just for one more time to watch his grandsons play. So enjoy that and, and treasure that. And it comes through and it's really neat. So I just wanted to share that with you. So um, with that being said, John, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and you get the last shot, if you will, with Grant. Grant, um, this for me, I mean, we've done a lot of them. Uh, we've, we've talked to hockey players, journalists, uh, stars, even food critics lately. Me and Mark touched on them all lately. But I got to tell you, when I saw you at that Hockey Hall of Fame dinner, and I knew you were being inducted in because I had been inducted in three years ago, I knew you were going to be inducted. I got to tell you, the, the memories of you when Mark and I were um, growing up there and we're not that far apart in age, uh, when you came up as that 17-year-old, I'll never forget 1974, 75 Never forget it. He put you on a line with Fit Martin and Dennis Hall. And uh, I remember you scoring a goal in one, a first round playoff series against Jerry Desjardins in a game, the only game you guys won in that first round series. Makita scored in overtime. I met you at Bruno's. Uh, Br I met you at Brunetti's restaurant through the uh, Caputos and the Prestas, who now my son is um, their son in law. And a big shout out. Uh, from them, the Antonella, and uh, there's another Antonella Berlin, Antonella Caputa Presta. I think they still have crushes on you, which is my son's mother in law and uh, the aunt. And of course, big shout out from Robertino Presta from Caputo's. Grant, great memories. It's that first impression I tell people. And that number 22, you coming up as that rookie, 17 years old. And again, it just, I wish we could go back. Yeah, because that was a time for me and Mark when we were growing up in a small town called Norridge, Illinois. It was something. Congratulations to you on that Illinois Hockey Hall of Fame. And I always say this to people, but I want a part two. I want you to come back on. I thank you. And Mark and I think this was fantastic to me. Well, I'd be honored to come back on. I love I I, I love I love. I love the history of the game. I wish I would have been much, much better at it when I was younger. Uh, uh, I was always thinking that I was writing history, 
which I guess I was, but I wish that I would have truly understood the game better, the, the understanding of the history part of it, because that's what we look at today. That's what I share with my grandchildren is, is learn what the, all these players, the sacrifices their families went through, the sacrifices the fans went through. And I couldn't be more honest. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a big music fan and I, can't, I, I couldn't play any instrument. Um, and, uh, but, you know, when you hear a song and it's a, kind of a cheesy song, but Andrew Gold wrote and, and performed Thank you for being my friend. And the game has allowed me to thank you for being my friend. Fans, uh, you know, it's just, it's a friend game. It's a friend to friend. I, I knew so many people from, uh, unfortunately, like Mr. Caputo, I, uh, you know, um, I, I had, so many dear friends from those early, early years of my Blackhawk life, and they're still deep, deep rooted friends today. And I can't thank them enough for being my friend. Well said, um, you've captured it all. This has been, like John said, this took us to kind of another level uh, emotionally and, and it's been really cool. And we thank you for your time and to John's point, um, Grandpa Grant, we're going to have you back. We'll talk about the wolves and your grandson some more because we'd love to hear about it. You stay well, enjoy the summer, and we'll catch up real soon. Gentlemen, thank you. This has been great. And again, John, thanks for uh, for finding me that evening. I'm honored to be a part and uh, a part with you. And we got to get uh, Phil on here. You got to get me Phil for Mark. Not a problem. Uh, get get both of you. Hey, I'll tell you what, we'll go for a hat trick. We'll get you, Johnny Marks, and Phil Russell, and we'll get ratings <laughs> like nobody's business. Yeah. Uh, all right, gentlemen. All right, have take a care. Great one. Be good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.